So Tetra Speakers for me is a lifelong pursuit of uh, perfection in music. Um, the artists certainly uh, give it their all, and when it comes to speakers, that's what Tetra Speakers does. That's what I do, no stone unturned to get to that lo last note, um, that last little symbol in the back corner. Um, it's all about uncovering what's there. And I owned a stereo store and I was selling the latest and greatest equipment and I never felt that I could, I never could sell to a musician. And I always thought it was because they wanted to have a new guitar or a new bow or an amplifier for the guitar. But the truth is they just didn't hear what they wanted to hear in what I was presenting to them in my store. They just as soon listen to a table radio. I agreed with them and uh, I ended up leaving the store and becoming a speaker designer in my pursuit of audio perfection. My pursuit, my personal pursuit, love of music, has gone on to me capturing or Tetra capturing the ears of some of the iconic musicians of uh, the planet. And uh, for them, when they hear Tetra, it's the preservation of their music. So, you know, as Herbie Hancock said, when he first heard his Tetras, he said, Adrian, I played a note. I just thought it got mixed up, mixed out, ended up on the cutting room floor. And when the Tetras played his music, that note was back. We're trying to marry Tetra speakers, the sound of Tetra speakers, with the Immersex chair um, is seamed up rather flawlessly with our speakers. And it does actually present a, 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 a next feeling beyond just your ears. And it actually goes up and down your spine and it's frequency dependent and it actually does add. And I wasn't expecting to hear that today. I was expecting to hear things just a little separated out and almost, almost annoying. And that didn't happen. It, it was quite a revelation hearing this today with our speakers. And it's, it seems like a match made in uh, Toronto. <laughs> when I design a speaker, I'm not thinking about how it's ultimately going to look, but how it's going to react to this, the crossover and the components we put inside. So it is, uh, it is supposed to not add or take anything away. Um, so therefore you won't find any boxes in Tetra. Everything's got a shape to it. And when you think about instruments, there isn't any box shaped instruments except uh, Bo Diddley's guitar. And that was a gimmick, right? But it worked, worked for him. Uh, maybe the hurdy-gurdy, right? Um, but when you put a box in a room, which is a box, you're actually creating problems. So then you have to now treat the room to deal with the fact that you have these reflections everywhere that are multiplying each other and interfering with the music. So you really do, when you, when you do it properly and you pull all the elements together, it's like making a guitar or an instrument that plays all the instruments because it's not just the guitar. It's a drum, it's a bass, it's the singer, it's the cymbal over here, it's the background singer over here. And you want every one of those things to have its space and time as it was recorded. And you want to feel like, hey, I'm in the studio with those musicians. I do it all by ear. I don't use any test equipment. My, my hearing is my test equipment. So when you look at a speaker, you have a, a low frequency driver, the bass driver, that's a bigger driver. As you go up in frequency, the middle range gets smaller and the tweeter gets smaller, right? As you go up in frequency from the bass into the middle into the tweeter, you don't want them to do that and collapse into their dimension. You want them to go out, the tweeter go out this far, the mid-range go out this far, and the woofer to go out this far. And when you have it seamed up and they're staying in a line, as you go up in frequency, you're now able to listen behind because it's not over here at the mid-range, right? You're actually listening through this perfect frequency response, top to bottom, and the speaker disappears when, when, when it's seamed up. What happens usually as you go up in frequency, it collapses onto itself and you're able to say, I'm listening to a speaker. Right now, if you walked into the Redwood Theater and we were playing music, you might think Garth Brooks is up on stage. I've seen it many times. What, is this, this is live music. And uh, 
and only the presence of a musician can really give you live music. However, it was recorded by a musician playing live music. So all I have to do is put an electron microscope on that recording and just take what's there and make it go seamlessly lower frequency to top and not draw any attention to anything. And that's, that's what happens. You don't, you don't know there's a speaker there. So that's, um, I really do look at myself as this is my time here on earth and this is what I'm here to do, right? And it's been a lifelong struggle. When I was 10 years old, I took my father's high-end expensive Wharfdales apart and started cutting out the crossover parts inside and listening and going, okay, I hear what that does. Now that was when I was 10 and when I became that speaker designer, um, I did the exact same thing. I listened to parts. Now you could buy a software that will tell you to make a crossover and they'll give you the exact printout of what you need to do. And we've did that for three years. But at the end, the computer couldn't put a speaker together well enough that we could actually ask the parts cost for it. We certainly couldn't put a markup on it because um, it, it, it didn't do anything special. So the bass driver goes from the low note and it goes up into the middle. And what you want to do is stop that bass driver from going up into the middle range, right? So you have to tail it off, right? Into the mid range. So you tail it off. Now you can tail it off really sharp or you can just roll it off slowly into the mid range. And you may take the mid range and bring the mid range back here, put it on top and then go from there. So what I do is I listen to each driver we're using and decide, that's the range I'm going to use, right? And I just, I, I stop that woofer working at a certain point and then I move on to the mid-range and bring that in. Now that could go up slow too, or that could go up really fast, right? The mid-range is on, right? And then the third piece here is the tweeter and it sits on top like a cherry. As you go up through the mid-range, as you go into the high frequency, it too has to open up. And, uh, and then the roll up into that is either a steep one or a slow one. So that, it's really about, you know, the, uh, it was a toy as a child. You turn it and all of a sudden, oh, the kaleidoscope yeah, the kaleidoscope, thank you. And, and that's really what it is. It doesn't look like something and then boom, it looks like something. And that's really all I'm doing is the kaleidoscope deciding that's, that's the picture I want. That's the right picture. And then leaving it there. And then when you add music to it, it's only going to give you exactly what is there. So my job is to get out of the way. I don't put a sound on it. It's the sound of the music that I'm going for. A, a music is an emotional thing, and yes, you think about it, but it really does affect your physiology as well. Like, you know, we've, hopefully we've all experienced goosebumps um, listening to music and hair standing up on our neck or on our arms or on our legs. And the better speakers do that better. Like you'll just, you'll, it'll be more of a physical reaction to an uh, auditory thing. Yeah. My first impression of this uh, chair in, in association with our speakers is that it's, it's, it's going to the next level. It's when you go to a restaurant, for example, back to that, you, you know, they, a lot of attention is put into the decor and the meal and the plate and the, you know, and then they, the last thing they do is they put in some speakers. And they're not good speakers usually. And they do all this stuff and they charge you a nice price for a nice meal and then they assault your ears, right? So, and, and that actually is annoying. It's, it's taking away from, better to have no music at that point, right? If it's, if it's not good. So when you have a tetra, even a small pair of tetras in the room, you will, you will feel that the band is there. What's happening with the chair now, though, is we could go out with our friends that are, having, that are hearing impaired and sit next to them and feel the exact same music that they're listening to. Well, what, what we're, we're trying to accomplish here is some type of um, uh, a spa experience, right? Something different, um, not, not just aromatherapy, but audio therapy. We have uh, five models in ranging in price from 2000 a pair up to 60000 a pair. They all have the same sound, whether you have the biggest ones or the smallest ones, it's only 
presence is different, what you feel that way. So a small pair of speakers in this situation with the Emota chair would be a nice combination. You don't need to rock the house when the chair is rocking, right? And uh, you don't have to bother your neighbors. You're actually feeling like you're listening a lot louder than you are. So that's another good thing about this is you can live in an apartment and rock out now. We developed this speaker. Uh, it's the version two of our 606, which we made with Rob, Rob Fraboni. Um, Grammy-winning producer, worked with uh, the Rolling Stones, Eric Clapton, um, uh, Bonnie Raitt. And uh, I first met him at a show in New York. He came in the room, we were playing our little speakers. And he came in, he goes, whoa, this sounds nice. He's a VP at Island Records as well. And he, he sits down and listens, and then he goes, uh, hmm, Keith would like these. Now, we're in New York, and there's only one Keith in New York. So, okay, I'm like, okay, so Keith, okay, so meet me after the show. I can't sell them, they're under bond. I'm in New York. So we came after the show, and I, we went and had a bite to eat, and then I put my speakers in the back of his car, and he drove away. And I didn't know if I'd ever see him or the speakers again, right? But he calls me up about three weeks later and says, Keith Richards and the Rolling Stones are coming to Ottawa for the first time in 25, 30 years. And I'm coming up with them because I'm Keith's ears, right? One of the first concerts so, of the tour. And so we, uh, he said, come to the hotel room. Um, when they landed, he called, you know, come down to the hotel and, and uh, you know, introduce you to Keith and then we'll figure out what speakers we want to introduce him to. So we, um, uh, I go to the hotel and I, I'm in the room and I'm talking with uh, Blondie Chaplin, the singer of Sail on Sailor, and Bernard Fowler, the, the background singer and a jazz singer in his own right. And I just, hi Bernard, hi. And I, behind me I hear a match, right? Turn around and there's Keith lighting a cigarette, right? Pleased to meet you, Adrian, right? So we ended up on a love seat together it's my first time with Keith, listening to our 406 speakers. He put on Bigger Bang, the album had just come out. I'm a Stones fan. And as a child, I envisioned myself, I want to sit and listen to records with the Rolling Stones. Okay? And that's really part of this, right? I wanted to meet these people and I love music. So that gave me the entrance into it. But anyway, we're on the love seat. We're listening to Rough Justice, the first track, and we're air guitaring together. Keith Richards and me, Blondie Chaplin, uh, Bobby Keys is here, sax player. And Rob's over there just observing this. And uh, I turn to Keith, I say, great record, Keith, right out of the gate, right? Like first track of a Rolling Stone, I'm listening to it with Keith, right? New record, and he goes, hey, thanks, Adrian. He said, uh, great speakers too, right? And I turned to him, I said, Keith, I said, you know where I get my inspiration when I get stuck? And he says, no, tell me. I said, it comes to me in my sleep. And he says, like satisfaction, brother, I get it. Right? It was like this great moment. And that is what happened. Like I, when I say I sat and listened to parts when I was 10, I sat and listened to parts when I was 50. And I just listen, listen. I did it for three years, just listening to that capacitor, this value, changing the slope, mm -mm, figuring out and not liking it, and then backing it up and going again. And it was either 10,000 hours or um, divine intervention, but I had a vision in my sleep. And in that vision, I was traveling through the wires because the speakers weren't sounding right. And I was traveling through the wires and I could see the energies and I could see the bottlenecks. And I just, and, and it was actually had a soundtrack. It was Peter Gabriel's song, And Through the Wires. And here I was going through my crossover and seeing like, it was like a journey to the center of the earth, right? And sure enough, I woke up, I went downstairs, two in the morning, doot, 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 two parts in, boom, there it was. And it's been there ever since. And I don't think about it when you, there's something really, uh, uh, your music, your, your brain on music, there was a study done at McGill University and they brought Sting in and they put Sting into a, into a uh, MRI and they had headphones on him and they played him some, a tune of his own, but it was Muzak, so devoid of any emotion, right? You know, going elevator. 
And they did an MRI and put that aside. Now they played, said they played him Sting, police song, right? Did an MRI, put that aside. And then they said, okay, uh, Sting, we want you to think of, come up with a song, like compose a song. And they did an MRI. And took that picture, put it aside. Then they compared him and Sting comes out of the chamber. And they're looking in the computer together. And he goes, Sting, this is your brain on, on your Muzak, right? It's flat, different part of the head up here. And here you are with the police, or Sting, and a different part of your brain. You're more engaged. It's lighting up a bit more. But when you went to compose a song, you went way back here, right? And that's not normally something you have access to. And, uh, and Sting got a, a look on his face of, I don't want to know this. I don't want to know where it comes from. Not, I understand that. I'm not an engineer. I don't have any right to get to these people, but with Tetra speakers, I'm on the level. I have something for them. And when, when a Tetra um, endorser comes along, they pay for their speakers and they endorse for free. It's not a commercial relationship. And for them, it's the preservation of their music. I played a note, it got mixed out, it's back. Ron Carter, world's most recorded jazz bass player, Guinness Book of Records, said, I've been in the Kind of Blue studio 50 times. And I set myself up and I get the sound of the bass off the wall. I hear it in the playback room, but when, by the time the product comes, the CD or whatever, it's gone. It's not what I heard and it's, you know, what a waste of my time. But Adrian, when you brought your speakers, all of that came back. I could remember every day, every, where I was set up. And that is what the musicians are reacting to. And as Herbie Hancock says, it's the tone. And that's it. It's the tone. I totally believe in the, in the healing power of music, not just um, the, the spa benefits. You know, we all like nice music in the background, but the healing power. Um, for example, I have, have customers, listeners, who were going through cancer and chemo and couldn't keep their chemo down unless they went into their bedroom. They put their tetras in the bedroom, lied down and listened to Elton John, right? And just drifted away and they kept their chemo down, you know? And that's the power of music. The original tetra was designed by Wayne Prince, who um, approached me. Uh, he knew me as a salesperson. He approached me as, would I make this tetrahedron speaker work for him for surround sound for his home theater and he had a couch that was a pink couch and it had five skins on it leather skins and you could put five of me on it and our feet wouldn't be touching the floor it was a very crafted uh, gifted designer and uh, he came with that shape and i really do treat that as his shape okay but that the way that that happened i was supposed to be the salesperson that's my background is sales. Sales. The we, the cabinet maker Wayne was to be the cabinet maker, and he had the shape. He put that together. I got a friend who worked at the National Research Council who purchased, who was to be the crossover designer. Going back to when I was ten, cutting parts out of my dad, I said I can't do that. Right. So for three years, the crossover designer came with parts, put them in the speaker, and we'd listen to it. And like I said, I couldn't sell them for the parts cost. At that point, the crossover guy blamed the cabinet shape, right? And the cabinet guy says, no more. And he calls me up because he had, he did everything perfectly. Like if he made a prototype, it was done perfectly. Wayne had decided that he had had enough and he called me over to his place. And I get there and his fire pit is there and he's got a stack of tetrahedrons in the fire, picks up the gas can, whoosh, throws gas on it, whoosh, again a match, whoosh, whoosh, and the flames start going up, this pile of tetrahedrons, and everything was falling apart. And I watch it for about a minute, and then I look at the top two, I'm looking at it thinking, you know what, you're not done with this, Adrian. So I, I said, I looked at Wayne, I said, well, I guess I'm the speaker designer now, and I grabbed the top two out of the fire and put them in my car and left. And so for the next, three years, I got on my hands and knees putting parts in like I told you. The, um, 
So, but at that moment, Wayne's tetrahedron got me back on my life's path. That, that, that series of events. And I knew when I had my store, I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. And when people hear these speakers, they know that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's what I want. I want to get what I'm supposed to be doing out to as many people while I'm still alive. Because it's, it's wonderful to have these relationships with people that send you music, send you gifts, and they're buying from you and they're sending you things because you've changed their life, right? And they're buying from you. Like, that's pretty amazing. Tetra's a totally, um, really a word of mouth, except we have a web presence, um, um, which draws people to us with the things that we are doing. You won't find a lot of marketing hype on our website. It's really, we are the real deal. This is, this is, this is where you, this is the source. And I've certainly been in front of many heavy, heavy players, and not once have I had any musician say, I don't get it, right? They get it right away, because it's their music. So it's really been quite a journey for Tetra. So now to see, having this door open here, where we're now incorporating um, with the hearing impaired, but also expanding the listening experience to invoke your, your physical presence, um, it's, it's fascinating. Next step.